My guest on this week's episode of Suzzin Search is Lisa Schneider. Lisa is an in-demand conference presenter and frequent podcast guest. A short list of the conferences Lisa has spoken at includes Search Love, the Digital Summit Series, SeerFest, Women Tech Global, and many, many other places. Lisa specializes in product strategy. She frequently works as a fractional CPO with an array of companies ranging from startups to enterprise businesses. Lisa helps these companies navigate the myriad challenges of organizing a team around a successful product launch. I caught up with Lisa after she gave a much discussed speech at Search Love about cross-functional strategy. What are some of the common pitfalls of product strategy? How do you get alignment across teams of sales, marketing, and product? What tips does she have for fostering collaboration? I'm going to ask Lisa these questions and many others. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with Lisa Schneider. We'll chat about stakeholder volleyball. I'll ask her about her strategy pyramid. And we'll spend a little time chatting about how Nest won market share despite having an inferior product. All right, Lisa, welcome to Sesame Search. How are you doing? I'm good. Hi, Mark. How are you? Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. I just watched a killer presentation from you at Search Love. It's about cross-functional strategy. And so I, I think before we can talk about the solution, I need to, we need to better understand the problem. And so you have a great term for, for, it's almost like a feeling that I'm familiar with. I bet many of our listeners are familiar with this feeling. In this talk, you talk about stakeholder volleyball. How is stakeholder, stakeholder volleyball? Yeah. How is it played? And what does this have to do with cross-functional strategy? Yeah, it's um, stakeholder volleyball, by the way, is not a fun game. <laughs> so if, if you think about a really good game of volleyball, whether you play or whether you watch, right, you've got a couple of people to a bunch of people on one side of the net and they are working together, right? Their, mm -hmm. their goal is to get that ball over the net as a team and they don't care who hits the ball, who falls on the ground, right? They're going to work as a team to get the ball over the net. But stakeholder volleyball is when you're on one side of the net and your colleagues are on the other side of the net. In your mind, your colleagues are on the other side of the net, right? Or you're on the other side of the net from your colleagues and you just take the ball and like you do a thing. I don't care what to put, you know, you're in product, you're in marketing, you're in customer service, you're in sales. I don't care, but like you do a thing, you just take it and you pop the ball over the net to them. And it's like, now it's their thing to yeah. deal with. And that does not go well. It does not make anybody feel good and it does not lead to good outcomes. No, it, it certainly doesn't. And, you know, you, you kind of, in the talk you go, okay, in an organization, really not even, doesn't matter if it's a big organization, large organization, mm -hmm. small organization, whatever, uh, you're going to have different functions. You're going to have marketing, you'll have sales, the product, and they're all doing some activity. They're all, like you said, they're all doing stuff. <laughs> They may be well-intentioned, they're hardworking, they're smart, but there are several cautionary tales about when these departments aren't working together. It seems like we should take a vocab word. Like I'm, I'm thinking back to school, you have like the, the bold word in the textbook, misalignment. What does misalignment mean in this context? Yeah, misalignment usually happens because people skip foundational strategic work. And I think this happens because a it's it's sometimes seen sort of as like soft work. And, and I say all the time, like, we're going to have to stop calling them soft skills, yeah. but it can it can feel like either soft work or it doesn't feel like it has the forward propulsion of like doing tactics. And so people get frustrated and they're like, hey, I have an idea. We've got a general sense of what we want to do. Here's a bunch of stuff we could do for it. Let's go do that. And, you know, in the, in the presentation, I have visuals where if you've got a pyramid that's your strategy pyramid and you've got mission and vision and objectives and strategy, and then you have tactics, when you jump from mission to tactics, right, you're missing all of that middle part that gives you that alignment that says, mm -hmm. hey, we're going in the same direction. We understand we're going to do this the same way. And wow. so one of the examples I give is working at a social enterprise startup that had a super strong mission. And, and that's why I think it's so important to understand that mission really isn't enough, right? So we're aligned, right? We all, we all feel very strongly about this mission, but you had three departments that were executing on this mission in three different ways. So you wow. can imagine they drove each other crazy. 
Yeah. And they were not, they were not sort of tangible outcomes, right? And, and to your point, that doesn't mean people weren't doing sort of good work in the bubble of what they were doing. It doesn't mean they weren't, you know, smart and nice and well-intentioned, right? Like bad outcomes come when people are not aligned. And when everybody was left to sort of like envision this in their own way, they weren't aligned and it didn't work. And you can see this with, with big stories too, right? I use the story of Honeywell and Nest and this Honeywell. Not my favorite. That's what I ask you. Yeah. Yeah. Honeywell. So I, I really got this story from someone in like inside at Honeywell and they were first to market with what they called an interconnected thermostat. And they had built like a really good product and Nest came out with their thermostat. Not a very good product, right? Not a very, <laughs> not a, not a very good product. And in fact, you know, this was interesting to me as a product person, it was so not a good product as a thermostat, it did not keep the room at the temperature that you wanted to keep it, that they had to alter the UX to show the temperature that it was set to, and not the temperature that the room was, because otherwise users would see that number right. fluctuating. <laughs> but despite being a suboptimal product, right? They went to market. This is internet of things, right? We're targeting, you know, uh, early adopters. This is cutting edge, right? And, and they positioned it in a way that aligned, right? Product mm -hmm. and marketing were aligned with, we're building a cool new thing. Yeah. Honeywell built a cool new thing. Stakeholder volleyball a little bit, right? Handed it over to marketing, didn't a lot. And marketing just pushed it through their regular HVAC channel. So it didn't get the attention. They had a better product but the marketing of product were not aligned and didn't get the attention. So they really lost a market opportunity through that misalignment. Wow. And now, and now that now, uh, I, I always assumed Nest was just a better product until I heard this speech. I th thought that was yeah. great. Can I yeah. bug you for one more example from your talk, which I loved was the talk, uh, the portion about mission and vision. You yeah. actually worked with Marian Webster, who I think of as like the dictionary, but the mission and vision was stilting. It like didn't it didn't it didn't accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. So you, you like redid the vision and mission. Uh, yeah. Tell us that story and how how that all worked. Well, you know those two top pieces of that strategy pyramid funnel mission and vision are really critical. And I think you know the two stories show that in in the social enterprise one, right? They had a really clear mission. People were aligned. They didn't have a shared vision. And when I went to Merriam-Webster, I was brought in to do digital product innovation, right? Do product innovation. We've got a vision, right? And the vision is, you know, we're not just going to be sort of a dictionary with definitions. What does it mean to be a dictionary in the digital age? Let, we're going to do product innovation. And in the end, you know, it worked out really well. And some people who are sort of aware of this nod their heads and other people who weren't aware of this just, you know, it, it doesn't resonate. But, you know, we ended up doing things like having a huge Twitter presence and being followed by like celebrities and politicians and journalists. We got a truckload of media coverage. We won Webby Awards, Shorty Awards. Like it really sort of became this huge thing. And so when you tell the story like, hey, I was brought in to do digital innovation and then we won a bunch of Webby Awards. It skips the part in the middle where people look at you and go, um, why? Why should mm -hmm. we do that? And that's because there wasn't a mission. The dictionary had been, right, if you think about Merriam-Webster, I mean, listen, I got there, it was a 170-year-old company. It had been right. chugging along perfectly fine, right? It was a trusted brand. It was authoritative. It was respected. And, and they wrote dictionary definitions. And by the way, um, there's really strict criteria for both entering words into the dictionary and writing definitions, which is super interesting, but probably a story for another time. And, and, but that's what people sort of were attached to, right? We write dictionary definitions and we have really rigorous criteria. So that's not a mission, right? A mission is not your task. A mission isn't the thing that you do. It's the why you do it. And so without the why, they're focused on the task. We write dictionary definitions. What do you mean you want to go on Twitter and build a vocab learning app and start a podcast and write, do all of these sort of new products? What do you mean you want to sort of replatform and, and do a new database and, and, you know, we need new technology? Like we write dictionary definitions. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of sat back and I thought like I was really, a lot of what I wanted to do was inspired by 
the people at the dictionary and by the conversations that we were having. So even though from the outside, you're like, oh, whatever the dictionary writes, it's a book on the shelf. Inside people are like super smart, super quick, yeah. clever, yeah. funny, right? Sitting around geeking out about language, like the intellectual bar was really high. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna write a mission based on, on what I'm seeing. And so I wrote a two part mission and the first part was to propagate our irrational love of the English language and <laughs> irrational is because like English is a hot mess and it doesn't make any yeah. sense. I love but that. you know, I was an English major, right? Everybody there really cared about language, believe that words matter. And the second part was to help people understand and use language better so they can better understand and communicate with the world around them. Mm. And so when I shared this mission and, and somebody once asked me at a talk, like, how did you do it? And because they imagine like you get everyone in a room and you write stuff down, you put the yeah. sticky notes on the wall. And in this case, mm -hmm. I just wrote it, but I circulated this and everyone went, mm -hmm, yes, like that's who we are. That's what we do. And wow. then I said, okay, if we are here to propagate our rational love of English language, let's geek out about language on Twitter. And then they're like, oh, okay. Right, right. Oh man, I love this. And I mean, the, the, the yeah. strategy pyramid is very cool. I, I think about, um, you know, most conference presentations that I listen to and I go to a fair amount of these conferences are about tactical things or really like esoteric, uh, digital marketing advice. Um, really good presentations talk about strategies. You have this pyramid and I, I, you know, we, we got to put a, an image of it up there on, on the screen or something like that. But it has strategy and tactics towards the bottom. So tell us about the pyramid and why you, know, you mentioned a few times already, but why yeah. alignment along these pil the, the pillars of this pyramid leads to success. So they build upon each other. So the very right. top of the pyramid, right? The apex at the top point is mission, right? Why are you doing this? What is your motivation, right? What, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What makes you care about achieving these outcomes, right? So it might be, it's, you know, home buyer education, we want to remediate information asymmetry, it might be, we want to, you know, geek out about language and help people understand and use language better, right? What is your why? It starts with your why. And, and that sort of infuses because that's the first thing where you go, okay, if somebody has an idea, and it doesn't meet our why, we, that's probably a no, right, or a really serious conversation about a pivot. And then the next is vision. And that is what does this look like when we're when we're done? And the reason that's important is because in that example of the social enterprise startup, the mission was really clear, but you had three departments going about it in different ways, right? You had one department that was really focused on kind of this core idea of like education and a serious voice and um, access to information. You had a marketing department that was very sort of like chipper and friendly, and they had a newsletter that was very like wine o'clock kind of stuff. And by the way, right, both of those things, I want to say again, were good, but they were different and they were disconnected. Yeah. And then you had the biz dev team that was going out and because they didn't really have a connected aligned thing to sell they were very reactive right oh i talked to mark mark wants this we have to go and build this let me come back have a big meeting can we build this right and so now we're sort of coming up with these bespoke things to build and if you've ever been sort of on the on the product and marketing side of that it's like okay you just end up creating a frankenstein thing right i built this for this person and the other thing for that person and, and again you never get back to what is it that we're trying to do. And so they were sort of spinning their wheels and actually hadn't sold anything in, you know, probably a year, which is a long time not to, it's not to bring in any sure. new, right, new partnerships. Yeah. So, so that vision of how does the mission play out, right? You have to have alignment on that so that you can figure out, then you figure out what are we doing to get there? Then the next level is objective right? How will we measure this, right? What does success look like? I built a thing in order to solve this mission problem that I care about, but I'm going to measure it some way. And, you know, look, obviously it's money, right? But you know, what other things could it be? So your objectives could be, I reached this many people, right? I got X market share. I changed a system, right? Um, so think about what your objectives could be. 
when you are aligned as a team on mission, right? We're doing, this is why we're doing it. Vision, this is what it's going to look like. Objectives, this is how we'll measure it. Now we start talking about what are the strategies and tactics yeah. that will get us there? But we have a shared sense of where there is. Mm -hmm. And so then you can say, hey, here's a bunch of hypotheses. Here's things we want to test and learn, right? These things are true in both marketing and product. Um, we're going to experiment with a bunch of different things. Maybe it's channels, maybe it's, you know, keywords, maybe it's product features, but now they're all going in the same direction. And now we're aligned together so that we're not doing things that, that rub up against each other. Yeah. I, tell you, I keep yeah. picturing arrows, you know, like the, the, the misaligned, we have arrows pointing in all different directions. That's and then right. We're, you know, they're it's all like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz, right? Oh, he went that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, I, I think I get it. It's it's yeah very bad to not have alignment. It's very good when you have alignment. What I'm what I'm thinking about now is uh, this sounds like a lot of collaboration, and we need a lot of people in the room, and we need uh, you talk about not just a strategy but a shared strategy. Everybody's aligned with us. How, how do you do this? How do you get the collaboration? How do you get the, the people in the room? How do you get uh, butts in the seats? And how do you get buy-in from everybody involved? Yeah. So I would say that, you know, this is something that I talk about separately, which is if you're a C-suite leader, um, you kind of need to think about your leadership two ways. One is your vertical leadership of your team, but the other is your parallel sort of idea of first team, right? So the CMO, the CRO, right? The CFO, all, all the other people, right, are my counterparts. And it is our job to do this together. And ideally, if each of those representatives are good leaders and good representatives of their teams, they're not coming in, saying something, and then coming down and like dumping it, waterfall down on their team, right? right? They've talked to their team. Hey, here's some things that we're looking at. What do we see as a team? What do you want me to take back? But then they take back, right? And those C-level people are determining together, we're aligned together, and then they go back out and communicate back down to their teams based on your input. Here's where we landed. Now everybody's got information. Obviously, if someone's got a really important red flag or a really important point, right, let that bubble back up to mm -hmm. the team. But really, it's, it starts there with these first team principles and getting a lot. And that's part of the responsibility of leadership, yeah. really. And I think I think that people struggle with that because there's a really, for good reason, right? There's this sense of, hey, I wanna empower my people, but empower my people doesn't mean that you're not giving them creative constraints. Yeah. So the reason that I like this framework too is that gives creative constraints, right? So you know, if I've got a marketing team or a search team or a product team, you know, and I go and say, hey, right, based on all the discussions that we've had and you've been in some of them and I've been in some of them, we're going here and we're going after these results. Now you figure out how to get it done. Guess what? You're still empowering them to be independent, but they have a much clearer path. They know, right? Here's what I have to do to get success. Mm. Yeah. Um, they're not going to go do something and then have someone go back and go, you know, Lisa, that was a great idea, but really it wasn't what we had in mind, right? right. So when you think about empowering your people, it's not to let them run off in 16 directions. It's to give the creative constraints and then, and then you let them go figure it out. Yeah, that's really good. And I, I wonder if we could, if I could dwell on, on the leadership part of that mm -hmm. answer a little bit longer. So yeah. it's, it's like so logical how you put this, but collaboration is really tough. I mean, you're going to have disagreements and debates mm -hmm. and discussions and, uh, you know, passionate, <laughs> you know, passionate debate as we go through this. Where does this start to get hard? And is, there, is there a little bit of like these classic business principles of a disagree but commit, these kinds of things that, that go on here? What, as a leader, what advice would you have for the, the person in that room who's trying to shepherd this discussion along and this debate along? So it's, it's constructive. Everybody's getting their point of view across, but it's going to get tough at some point, isn't it? Yeah. So I think that goes to a couple of things, right? One is, one is, is culture in the first place, mm. right? Do you have a team that is A, made up of, and B, sort of structured to reward, right? People that have, I would say, high learning mindset, low ego, right? Collaborative 
mindset um, with the idea that like the rising tide lifts all boats, right? If we do something good for the company, it doesn't matter sort of where the idea came from. And you know, what gets rewarded gets encouraged. So I, I don't think that there's like a soup, hey, here, use this framework and then you'll be all set. Like if you've got a brilliant jerk in the room and that's something that your culture is tolerated, then that conversation will be hard, right? If you have set people up to reward them based completely on their you know, individual um, pieces and not in part on the group, if, if you as a CEO are part of the way that you generate power is by pitting people against each other, I do not have a framework that is going to help you, yeah. right? A lot of it does come down to culture. So look, like if you're the CEO, then at some point you make the call. And then I, I do, it's it's interesting that you said disagree and commit because I, I think about that a lot and I even say it to my kids, right? In, in terms of like, right, you're in class with a teacher. You know, I don't care if you disagree with your teacher, right? You can speak up and then, and then at the end of the day, they're the teacher. And if they're doing something immoral, right? If they're punishing a kid who didn't do anything wrong, you should definitely speak up. But if they are not doing anything, and this goes for work too, right? Immoral, illegal, or unethical, um, right? At some point you disagree and commit and you say, okay. And you can even be honest with your team about that, right? You can go back to your team and say, hey, this is the decision. I know we were advocating for this and I advocated for it, but we ended up in a different spot. Now let's try to make it work, right? I recognize that we disagreed and there's nothing inherently wrong with this. So now we're gonna try to make it work. Really good advice. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think this all makes perfect sense. The last thing about this, you know, we talked about at the beginning sales, marketing, product, and, and that's maybe an oversimplification, but that, that's a, those are the three, you know, three core functions in many businesses. Is there anything that you look at, and maybe maybe it's nothing, but do you do you look at those differently? Like I, I'm going to approach a salesperson differently because a lot of those people are, you know, solo players and they they have big egos and they 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 want to go go go. And they're impatient and bushy, and uh, we, we want to try and uh, begin to to use some emotional intelligence to to appeal to what they really bring to their, their special qualities that they have. Or are you looking at this as, you know, what it, it's the it's the what happens for the business is all that matters, and it doesn't really matter uh, whether you're in sales or product or marketing at all. Uh, I, I'm just curious how, how do you how do you approach those specific roles? Yeah. I don't think you can say it doesn't matter, right? I, you know, I say all the time, human psychology has not changed. <laughs> and, and I was an English major and I say, it's a thing that I learned, right? If you read books, you know, that sort of span hundreds of years, sometimes, you know, a thousand years, what, what you see is that like, maybe you'll struggle with the language of something written a long time ago, right? Some people love Shakespeare. Some people can't get through the language, but if somebody explains a story to you, you're like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense, right? Human yeah. psychology hasn't changed. So you do need to approach things with empathy. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the business books that I always recommend to people is called Getting to Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not new and it's not super trendy, but it is really about not like digging into your line in the sand and, and almost not letting your, I want to say counterpart in a negotiation, but just colleague in a discussion do that. It's like, why do you need that, right? So yes, salespeople get monetized on sales. They want the things that, that they think will go out and do that. Understand that, take that into account, figure out why do they think this other thing is gonna work better? Because so often when you find out the why, what you find out is the thing that they're clinging to is not, since we're using a lot of cliches, right? There's more than one way to skin a cat. So yeah. tell me why you need this, because maybe I have another way to do it that'll meet both things. And so that's like really important. If you can get underneath the rationale, like, okay, the super corny story, this is a super corny story from getting to yes, is two kids are in the kitchen and they're arguing over an orange and the mom walks in and she's like, all right, it's not a baby. I can cut the orange in half. So she says, okay, we're going to cut the orange in half. And the kid's like, no way. I need a whole orange. So the mom says, well, why? Like, why do you need a whole orange? And kid number one says, well, I'm going to a birthday party and I promised to make a cake and the cake requires the zest of the whole orange. Mm -hmm. And kid number two says, well, I'm going to picnic and I promised to bring a fruit salad and I need the whole orange to fill up the fruit salad. And guess what? I can zest it and then you can cut up the fruit. And like, it's mm -hmm. not always that easy, except sometimes it is almost that easy. Right. 
That's a, that's a great story. Well, listen, Lisa, you really you really had an amazing speech at the very last search love. So everybody's sad that this conference is ending and it must have been quite an honor to be there. Uh, if people want to learn more about you or connect with you online, where, where should they go to do that? What's your favorite social media? Those sorts of details. Yeah, I'm, I'm most active these days on LinkedIn. So find me. I'm Lisa Schneider and I'm on LinkedIn. That's the best place to find me and connect and chat. And I'm always nattering on about stuff like this. Well, I love it. This is like right, my kind of thing. And I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to give you a virtual cheers. Thanks for uh, closing out your day with us. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, you hope your son's arm gets better and everything like that. I, I remember that pain. So uh, Lisa's son's broke her arm right before, broke his arm right before uh, the speech as we were talking yeah. off air. But yeah, um, that's a bummer. He's all right. He's healing nicely. All right. I've, I've been there. I, I have some tips. That, or if I could sign his cast, I would. Um, for, for everybody else watching, we'll be back next week with another episode of Sudden Search. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Thanks, Ron. Bye.